yeah, I think I think we both agree on that. So that's that's good. But a point to ponder. It's one thing to be biased. It means you stand for something, right? It means you have an opinion. But it's entirely another thing to be hypocritical or to be dishonest. And if you are hypocritical or dishonest, you have absolutely no right to any credibility whatsoever. In light of recent events, the shooting in Moncton and in downtown Vancouver uh, just a few days ago, I thought I'd make a video to settle uh, what it takes, the real information, of what it takes to own and, uh, and acquire a firearm and to, to operate a firearm in Canada. Uh, here we go. I've made the decision. I want to buy firearms. Uh, first thing I'm going to have to do is register for a Canadian Firearm Safety Course. Uh, that's going to cost me somewhere around $200, give or take. Some people charge more, some a little less, but that's what the cost is, roughly. Uh, I'm going to register for a course and I'm going to go. It's about 16 hours. It's a two-day safety course. One day is the non-restricted, which are typically rifles and shotguns. Second day are restricted, which are typically pistols. And any shotgun and any rifle of any kind for any reason that the government or the RCMP think should be restricted. Uh, so I take this two-day safety course and during that course uh, there's a lot of book work. We're going to have to move our way through two books about this thick. Uh, we're going to handle disabled firearms, uh, rifles, shotguns, and pistols. Learn how to load them, unload them, handle them, uh, basic safety, all the rest of that stuff. You're going to write two uh, written exams and two practical exams. You have to pass both exams by a score of 80% or greater. At that point you'll get a document called a course report proving that you passed the course. So you take this course report and you put an envelope with a picture a guar that's guaranteed, right? So you've got to get a recent picture of yourself. And you have to provide an application in there and another fee, an $80 fee to be exact. So you're into this thing for about 300 bucks. Then on the application, you provide all your personal contact information. You provide your mental health history, if any. You provide any situations where you have any, any kind of contact with law enforcement uh, or the justice system. On top of that, you provide contact information for all of your conjugal partners, if any, for the last two years. Then you provide contact information for two people that have known you three years or longer that will provide personal references that you are not a violent guy or solve your, solve your problems with violence or whatever. Trustworthy, whether they have concerns about you owning firearms, all the rest of that stuff. And you send all that stuff to the government. Now, the government sits. The Firearm Center will sit on that information for 28 days as per the Firearms Act. There's a waiting period there. Then they dig up all that information, they enter it, and then they do a deep uh, criminal record check on top of that. And that's electronic, happens you know, almost instantaneously. Then they will decide whether they want to contact any or all of these people, including yourself, and talk directly to you about why you want firearms and you know, all the rest of that stuff. So I've gone through the system myself. I've been uh, referenced for other people. I've had those interviews. Some of them run half an hour. So it's, <laughs> it's not a joke. They're not handing licenses out on the street corner. Then, from three to six months after you've submitted that information, you may get a card in the mail, you may get a license. So it's cost you around 300 bucks, taking three to six months. Now, when they issue that card and they approve your license, they send that out to you, you now begin getting a criminal record check every day for the rest of your life or as long as you hold that license. Every day. So think about that for a second. Your name goes through CPIC, which is the police information uh, database, every day. Convicted pedophiles don't get a criminal record check every day. Police officers get a criminal check record check once. Okay, so put it in perspective. Not only do you get a criminal record check every day and they monitor that. I'm being monitored like a criminal would. But on top of that, I actually forfeit some of my charter freedoms, my charter rights. One of those is the right against on, uh, unwarranted search and seizure. Uh, upon reasonable notice, and it's been determined that reasonable notice is 24 hours, the Canadian Firearm Center can actually search my home. And anywhere in my home where firearms are maybe reasonably kept, which is basically everywhere, right? Well, we think you have pistols and you keep them inside books. We're going to check all the books in your home. We're going to check under your bed. We're going to check in your drawer, in your bedside table. We're going to check everywhere if they want to. And they actually don't even need justification. They don't need a reason to do that. It doesn't happen very often, but still it's there. I have my home searched without warrant. So interesting. So keep that in mind. Now, all of everything I've just told you, that's, now I've got a license. I don't have any guns yet. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's how far we got to go already. 
Now that monitoring, I'll say one more thing, and that monitoring thing, if I get into any kind of contact with police, like get arrested or you know, warnings or whatever, they know immediately. And the next day, the firearm center calls me and says, hey, what, what went on last night? And I gotta explain myself or it'll take my guns away. So this is a, a wickedly tight system. You know, don't be, don't be misled by anybody. All right, so now, I wanna buy my first gun. I take my license, I go to the store. If it's a non-restricted firearm, then it's basically a cash transaction, right? Or whatever, debit or whatever. It's, it's a transaction where I say, I'll take that firearm, I'll take this ammunition. They look at my PAL. Most people will verify that it's, that it's current and away I go with my firearm. Now, if I wanna get a restricted firearm, which are typically pistols or any rifle or any shotgun of any kind for any reason that the government or the RCMP thinks should be restricted. Example number one, like an AR-15, semi-automatic center fire rifle, just like any other non-restricted rifle. Exactly like any other rifle. Why is it restricted? Because it has a military or paramilitary appearance. Okay, it's restricted because it looks scary. And you can do the research if you like, that's the truth of the matter, that's it. Mechanically, there's nothing there that, of any significance. Uh, but nonetheless, so uh, I go and I wanna buy my AR-15. And I buy a non-restricted firearm at, at the same time. But the AR-15 is restricted, so I can't take it home when I first buy it. I have to get a bunch of extra paperwork. Part of that paperwork is there's a registration document for all restricted firearms, uh, let's say pistols. So let's talk about registration for a second. Restricted firearms, meaning primarily pistols, have been registered in Canada and are still registered since 1934. We've had a firearm registry for restricted firearms, for pistols, for handguns since 1934. And what, what, what's the firearm most used in crimes? Handguns, right? And how many of them are, are registered when they find them? Less than 5%. Okay, so firearms registry, we have all this history about, about pistols, about handguns being registered, and we know that the registry does nothing to stop these crimes. But yet, for some reason, some people in Canada thought, well, that didn't work. What could even be better? More of it, more of the same. So they wanted to do a long gun registry. Again, didn't do anything to prevent any crime. People are still using handguns, and they're still using long guns when they want to. So anyway, good to know. So I want my AR-15. I gotta wait for a registration certificate or transfer. Um, they have, it has to be transferred at the firearm center so I don't get to take it home right away. But not only do I need a registration certificate, I also need yet another piece of paper. I need an authorization to transport. So the government has given me a PAL with restricted. They check my criminal record check every day. They know they can search my home at any time but I cannot still be trusted to go from my home to the shooting range without another piece of paper. With that piece of paper, that makes me okay. Without that piece of paper, I'm not okay. So let's talk about that for a second. Here is the package that I have to carry around with me when I go from my home to the range to shoot my guns. Here it is, look at this. There it all is. If I forget my package of, see I got four packages to make sure I never forget and doing everything I possibly can to comply. But if I forget one, one sheet of this, my ATT or the registration for the certificate for the firearm that I'm actually transporting. If I forget one piece of paper, let's find out what happens. Do I get a fine? Maybe I get my gun seized and I gotta go get it? Let's have a look. Every person who stores, displays, transports, or handles any firearm in a manner contrary to the storage, display, transportation, and handling of firearms by individuals regulation, they like the long names, is guilty of an indictable offense and liable to imprisonment. In the case of a first offense, a term not exceeding two years. Two years. In the case of a subsequent offense, a term not exceeding five years. I'm in contravention if I don't have that piece of paper. I'm in contravention if I don't get an ATT. Five years? And what if you say, well, Rod, you know, if you're, let's say you're a criminal defense lawyer, ah, oh, they'd never give you two years on a first offense, dude. Don't worry about it, it's, everything's fine. They know that you're an instructor for the program. You're the one that's upholding all these laws and making sure that everybody else complies and that they know the, the law. Well, let's, let's see. Guilty of an offense punishable on summary because that's what they give to good guys. Two grand in six months. Well, I'll tell you this. If I got six months in jail right now, it would destroy my life. Destroy, I'd lose my house, my, my job, my family, everything. I have a criminal, like I'd have a firearm charge on my record. Convicted criminal. And what happens in the real world is, 
I may not have the $20,000 to defend myself, to not go to jail. And the Crown says, hey, well, we charge everybody. This is, this is what we do. And you know what? We'll let you off with no prison time if you just plead guilty. So this, it's an appealing choice for me because I'm like, okay, 20 grand, bankrupt me, maybe 50 grand, depending on the situation, right? Am I going to go bankrupt or do I just take this charge? They're going to give me no prison time and say a five-year firearm prohibition, so they'll destroy my guns. Uh, and I may have thousands and thousands of dollars worth of guns and prohibit me from ever, for ever even shooting a gun, having a gun in my hand. For what? For, for not having a piece of paper. So it's crazy. So how do I get this piece of paper? Another interesting point. To get an ATT, I have to have a valid PAL, Possession and Acquisition License. I have to have my firearms license. Then I have to join a shooting club and keep that membership up at all times. Usually around $200 a year is what that costs. Then I take the, the membership card and I send it to the firearm center and they issue me an ATT, which can be revoked at any time, which I have to renew every five years. If I forget, again, in contravention of all of this stuff, jail time. Now, sounds pretty easy. I'll tell you this, it's far easier to get an illegal gun than it is to get a legal one. Far easier. I've just told you what's required. I have to be on top of everything 100% of the time. I've got to be obsessed with making sure I've got all this stuff or I will go to jail. Now, I haven't committed any crime. I haven't shot anybody. So, good, good thing to think about. I'm going to leave you with one last thing. Okay? There was a, a shooting in Moncton where a guy sh walked through, somehow walked through, five RCMP officers and shot them all, killing three of them. It's a horrific situation that happened there. Do you think for one minute that he was like, okay, while I'm doing this, I'm concerned about the, the firearm charges. I'm concerned about that extra six months and two grand for illegally using my firearm, illegally transporting it during the commission of a crime. Obviously not, right? Murder's always been illegal in Canada. Shooting people has always been illegal. It's attempted murder. So the firearm charges, who are they, who are they punishing with that? Who is, like to, to own a firearm, it's a huge burden. It's a huge risk. Yet over two million Canadians still own firearms, legally. And it's speculated that over two million people actually illegally have firearms that didn't go through the licensing system because they've had them forever. Four million Canadians that haven't shot anybody. Kind of interesting. So get this. When something like, like this shooting happens, you get people coming out of the woodwork that don't know anything about firearms, they don't know anything about the laws, and they want to talk about it. Do me a favor. If you look at police, both municipal and federal, all over Canada, the police themselves, as individuals, on the job, have been guilty of major criminality. They've been caught uh, doing hundreds, hundreds of counts of sexual harassment, sexual assault, drug trafficking, trafficking in guns, simple assault, murder. But we as citizens look at that and we say, well, you know what? I'm not going to paint the whole police force. I'm not going to paint the RCMP with the same brush because there's so many good people out there that are standing up for me and, 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 and upholding the law. Why? It's unreasonable for me to let a few bad apples spoil the whole bunch. I'm not going to let what a couple of these bad cops did reflect on the whole force because that is unreasonable. So a little while ago, one guy out of two to four million Canadians shot police officers. All I'm asking is for you to do your research and think about it and offer the private citizens, the law-abiding citizens of Canada, the same courtesy that we allow the police. That's all I'm asking. Point to ponder. Anyway, now you've got the truth of what it takes to hold, maintain, and, and use firearms uh, in Canada. I hope this helps, uh, and I look forward to talking to you guys again. Thanks for watching.